Hey, Warners, welcome to another episode of The Women Your Mother Warns You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy. You know me, I'm Gina, Master Sales Trainer and Coach at Sales Gravy, and I'm also a renegade. I haven't really talked about that too much, but maybe I should, because I brought on a fellow renegade. I bet you guys are wondering what that means. I'm not going to tell you right now, but I brought on a really cool woman that I'm super excited about. Natalie Tincher is joining us today. Who is Natalie? She is, I love this. I'm going to ask her what this means. An enthusiastic inspirer, inspirer. I'll let her say that. A passionate style strategist and curious entrepreneur. And she founded her company, BU Style, in 2010. And since then, she's worked with hundreds of personal clients, large corporations, and a major news network. Dying to know all about that. She finds pure joy in connecting with others and fostering a fun, empowering, and kind community of personal style support. One of the things I asked her was like, what style am I in today? I'll let her tell you that. I was curious because I'm feeling a bit cash today. She's got a strong focus on creating style brand alignment and strategies for executives and founders, as well as for businesses and their employers. She's certified in image consulting. This is why I have her here today, my lovely listeners. And she's got that through the Fashion Institute of Technology. Very cool. And is the host of Where Who You Are podcast. Now I feel guilty. I should be listening to that as well. We'll hear more about that. She's also the creator of the BU Style 6 Mythology and Assessment, which this is the meat of what I want to know, which identifies your unique spread of the six style personalities and how to use them to communicate your authenticity through your wardrobe choices. So excited. Welcome Natalie Tinsher to the show. Thank you, Gina. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I There's so many things I want to ask you. So many things I want to ask you. And the first thing I want to ask you, well, and I'm also excited about that you're in Chicago right now and you have a condo there because I'm from Chicago. And For those of you listening, I asked her why her dog is named Wrigley, hoping she would tell me it's after Wrigley Field, and it is. So here's the first thing I want to know. What got you into image consulting? I'm like fascinated by, I'm always fascinated about people's stories of how they started doing what they're doing. Absolutely. So I went to New York and I was previously an editor doing like donor relations publications for higher education, like really exciting. And I moved to New York with my partner at the time and he was in finance and I was like, editing thing I'm good at and it's just not for me. And I loved the world of fashion. And then when you move to New York, you're like, holy shit, I don't really know that I love this world of fashion because it's different than what you expect. It's hard to get into. There's a lot of walls up, but I love figuring out the style in New York. Like I would just look at people and just sit in a park and watch people. And I realized that I'm like, you know what? I'm not this New Yorker that's in all black all the time. I'm a Midwest girl, born and raised in Logansport, Indiana, but also I'm a city girl. I'm How do you merge these pieces? And I'm like, you know what? I bet other people have this issue. Like New York's a transient place. I feel like this is probably my way into the fashion industry because it's not necessarily fashion. It's about communicating intent. It's about style. It's about humans. And so I got on the internet. I'm like, I'm going to start this business. I didn't even know if it was a thing. And I Googled at the time, this was 2009, I believe. And there were maybe three other personal stylists or image consultants on the internet. And they all had like high heel shoes and looked thick and like, that's not me. No, no shame in that. But I'm like, no, I think there's just more like regular people I want to figure this out. You know, what brands work for me? What cuts? Who am I? How do I merge these worlds? So then I kept Googling and found that FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology, has a program that I could go and be trained. And I feel like anytime I do something, I want to have, even if I can do it well, and I've been dressing my friends, styling my friends for years since college, I wanted to have the actual methodology and the practical knowledge behind it. So I went to FIT and got certified in image consulting while I was starting my business, while I was working full time as an editor. I'm like, let me just see if this thing can take off. And lo and behold, I got my first client, got my second client, got my third client. Some of the clients came back. I'm like, oh, 
maybe this is a thing and this is how I can connect with other people and help others have this alignment and have a safe space to it, really explore their style. And then I just took it from there, quit my full-time job and said, I'm going to do it. And here you are. And here I am 13 years later. That's amazing because it is not easy to be in business for yourself. We can get into this later. I'm sure COVID had some kind of impact on you because I believe the style during the beginning of the pandemic was, I don't know what you call it. I'm sure you have a name for it. The COVID style, the I'm not leaving. Very relaxed. <laughs> relaxed to the max. <laughs> relaxed to the max. I am no, sure. No max relax and all cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure that there was a hit to the clothing market for sure. So thanks for sharing that because I was really curious about that. I want to really dig in and I want to come back. We'll come back to the sales aspect of this because I'm always fascinated as well about the sales approach that you take. You got the one client and it led to more, right? And then I'm sure you had a hiccup at the beginning of COVID. We'll come back to that. I'd like to jump into the mythology and the six style personalities. We are always talking about buyer personas and selling to a type of persona and knowing what your persona is, right? Psychologically, but let's talk a little bit about style of how you show up. Would you be willing to share, at least give us an overview of those six styles? Yeah. So one thing that really uh, confused a lot of my clients was reading these fashion magazines that try to tell them that they're like boho chic or French this or goth this or rock or that. And it really just created a lot of confusion. Like, well, I'm kind of this, I'm kind of that. And I would learned a little bit about personality and kind of connecting it all. And it was a very antiquated methodology that I'd seen. I'm like, I'm going to take this little nugget of what I learned in like an old FIT textbook. 13, I guess I created this three years ago, 10 years previous to that. Like, let me update it. Let me look at my client habits. Let me look at how they communicate their intent who they are and how that connects to clothing. So we can boil it down to these personalities that creates a common language. And so those are relaxed, classic, polished, soft, magnetic, and creative. Mm -hmm. So everyone is a spread of these and each one connects to different habits, different personality traits, the way you interact with the world and there are clothing characteristics that connect to those. So it's a really useful tool for two reasons. One, it cuts out the bullshit of if a trend comes and you're like, you know what? That's not in my style personality. I can just ignore it, even though every influencer under the sun is telling me I must have this or mm. every marketer is saying I must have this. So it helps clear out the noise because you know, okay, no, I'm magnetic. I probably am not going to wear a lacy top. <laughs> so it sort of helps you have some clarity around who you are. It's related to your five senses. We grow up understanding our senses and the flavor profiles we like, and it evolves with you. That's what I wish for people in this style personality journey is just inherently then understanding what's for them and what's not for them. So if they get a, a menu of choices, they can know what probably mm. they'll like based on this. So you can use it in many ways. So I feel like it's just such a useful tool for people. Number one, to understand who they are. Number two, to help understand others. So we'll get back to that in a sales capacity or if I'm going into a room and I know when I was at the news network, there were some, not always some friendly faces that I had to walk into the room with. And I would intentionally dress super, super magnetic. So I knew when I walked into the room, I was projecting a confidence that even if I'm like shaking underneath and I'm going to quiver, it gives me that extra filter of no, you've got this. You're a bad bitch right now. Like you're putting this message across. So you can use it also to align or to use it as a shield or a sword for yourself mm -hmm. as well. Or if you come across generally maybe really powerful and some people think you're intimidating, mm -hmm. you may want to bring in a little bit of soft if it's an environment that you want to be more approachable and just immediately give that that receptivity in it. So there's a lot of ways you can use it. It's, I super nerd out to it. I've tested it, created an assessment, 
that gives you your spread of personalities and refined it, user tested it, or client it. Now I think we've got it where clients will come to me and we use that language too. So like, you know, Natalie, right now I want to be more creative. And so we understand what that looks like and how to adjust their wardrobe strategy accordingly. Awesome. And so there was relaxed, classic, magnetic. What else was there? Polished. Soft. Soft and creative. So I'm guessing that this is not just dressing with who you are, but this is also, like you just said, also dressing the part where you need to dress the part for the audience that you're in front of without compromising who you are. Correct. Right. Correct. You can take who you are, put those elements in. But if you know you maybe need a little tweak to a line or to make your message stronger, then you can incorporate other elements of other style personalities to your advantage. OK, awesome. So high overview of each one of those relaxed. What would relaxed look like? Comfort is key. A thousand bajillion percent. Like if it's not comfortable, they're not even looking at it. Okay. Classic. Classic would be really utilitarian. They are the classic capsule wardrobe person. So it's like all the neutrals, everything must mix and match. And it's like, if it comes in navy, I also want it in black. So everything is adult gray animals. Okay. (laughs) I love it. That's magnetic. The magnetic is that bold, confident, either like high contrast patterns or bold colors. Like I'm walking in and I'm going to get shit done. Okay. Polished. Polished is that really tasteful, subtle detail where they'll notice like if each fork on the table is aligned perfectly or if the stitching in their button matches the stitching in their pants. So everything is that really like tastefully done where like they always just look so elegant. Okay. Soft. Soft is that big hug of like that receptive, really maternal or that safe space in the environment where if you're at a party, they're going to notice that no one's talking to you and they'll they'll one-on-one converse with you. So you like a big hug. Okay. And then creative. Creative as anything goes. It's like <laughs> whatever, like you may be one of the style personalities one day, another, it's like whatever my mood is, it's very much just for the mood. Okay, fantastic. And so at the beginning of this, I had shared with you before we started recording, I was like, hey, I don't know, what's, st- I didn't even think about being in style for her on this. I'm like, what style am I in? And you said, relaxed magnetic. So now that's a combination of styles. Everyone is a combination. And that's the beauty of it is that you're a spread. And so what it looks at is you're generally your top style personalities. Like I am like one or zero polished, which is maybe surprising for some people, <laughs> but I'm like one or zero polished. Like I can't be bothered really to have like nail polish on. And then that's how like unpolished I am, but I'm very high in magnetic, creative, relaxed. So all of my wardrobe is a combination. And so really like on the weekends, I'm probably a little more relaxed, but if I'm in public speaking engagements or something like that, I will show up more magnetic. Yeah, it makes sense. And that's what I was saying. Like, I think you said my magnetic came from the lipstick. All right. Bold red. Yeah. Bold red always. It's always the way to go. But today is a more relaxed day. I'm not training people. I'm coaching and having meetings, but I'm not. I got to look all that put together, which is a little bit of a different style. When I'm doing that today, I'm like, ugh. I just always put on my fleece jacket because I get cold and then I forget about it. And but the lipstick's always there. The magnetic's always there. Always there. And the nails and the hair. Right. Those the go to's the go to's. So that becomes your signature. That's one of your signatures. So that's when people talk about signature style. Like that is something that's relatable to you. So is that something that you look at when you're working with clients? So, for example, people do comment all the time on my lips, nails and hair always. And so then I was like, oh, well, that's me. And so I'm um, part of me has said. People kind of expect that of me. I've actually had people say if I don't have red lipstick, they're like, what, what's going on with your lips? Where's your OK? Lipstick? Where's your red lipstick? You don't have red lipstick on today. So then it's 
I feel like my style started to define me for me because that's how people were seeing me as well. Yeah, look at people see you in a certain way. And so then it's for you if you want to break that signature. You can't I mean, look at Michelle Obama recently in her book tour. She did a 180 and I was reading a few articles on that. And it, she was so used to being president's wife style. And then when it went on her own in this last book tour, she went like super magnetic. She went creative. She's like, I'm going to just be bold and be me. And it took people a minute, I think, to adjust. And then they're like, oh, I like this. And then they started equating her style with what she was doing. And she was breaking out of that Mm -hmm. role that she'd been boxed into. And she's becoming her own person and her own mission in this moment. And so it actually was a really a good jarring place yeah. of shift because it's like, nope, now I'm not confined by this. I'm going to I'm going to show me where I am right now. And again, it sounds like styling for the situation that you're in. Yeah. So, so you do an assessment. Tell us a little bit about what that assessment is and where does someone where would somebody get started with owning their style, defining their style, knowing their style. What does all that look like? And for me, I created the assessment exactly for that. So even if you're not into fashion, and I think that's a troubling part of the industry is that everybody has to put clothes on. So by putting on clothes, you have a style. Just like we have to eat. Yeah. In this world that we live in, we all have to put clothes on. And so it might as well at least communicate your intent and who you are and at least be some sort of showcase of the best version of yourself. Not saying you have to go by designer brands, but you should at least understand it. So that's why I created the assessment to be that first tool. And so for me, it's available online. I can give you that information later. So anybody can take it. And that was another reason. I'm like, you know what? I know hiring me one-on-one and most stylists are, it's it's expensive for some people. So I wanted to make it accessible. I wanted everyone to be able to have, like say the seat at the table to start exploring. So most of the questions have to do with adjectives about yourself. Like how would your friends describe you? I am this. I am, I am fun. I am reliable. I am those types of questions. And then some have to do with situational, like you get invited to a costume party or a themed party. How do you respond to that? And it equates to the different style personalities. So for me, I'm always like the more the merrier. Yeah, let's do it. And then some are like, ugh. I roll, I'll like nod to the theme, but like begrudgingly participate. So, you know, those situations start to help people think like, huh, how do I respond to this? What is my relationship with my clothing? Because most people haven't thought about it. Like what is my relationship to what I put on my body? And I think one of the problems with people getting sold and looking at a closet full of clothes with nothing to wear is they haven't created a relationship with their style. And so as such, it And so they keep consuming to chase a style instead of sitting with the pieces that they have and identifying what they like, what they don't like about it. What would balance out the flavor profile? We'll use that analogy again to make a more robust outfit that fits your taste. So, you know, it's really to help cut through the noise and to help people create that foundation. And then from there, they can start to connect it with their wardrobe choices once they have a profile and understand what each of the style personality means, and then they can start to shop at a store and connect it like, oh, that brand's super magnetic or that color super magnetic. That's me. That one's not. Yeah. That's really soft and that's not me. Or maybe like, I want to be more soft and my wardrobe is all polished. How do I add some soft into it? Yeah. Okay. So which would make your just life so much easier, right? I'm like, okay, this I know. I should wear this. I shouldn't wear that. It's an easier decision-making process. I went to Catholic school all my life. So when I got to college, I was like, what am I supposed to wear? So when you think about that relationship, (laughs) part of your profile, your target audience should be like, did you go to Catholic school? Did you have to wear a uniform (laughs) or were you raised Mormon and had to wear the things that covered? Yeah. Had to cover different parts of you. So you already were like cutting out 75% of choices. Yeah. Yeah. So I think about all this and the fact that when I did get to college, I never really defined a style per se because 
I was always in a uniform. So, and that's what's so interesting is that, you know, people look at, talk about how chic European dressing is, how chic French are and Italian. Well, they grow up understanding clothing and they grow up with that being part of them. And yeah. so we don't grow up so much that way. Typically, I would say in America, it's not as inherent in our yeah. DNA of my mom certainly in her elastic waist jeans and t-shirts wasn't saying like, so Natalie, look, look at this <laughs> fabric. And like, look, when you pick out your backpack, what, you know, binder looks nice with it. And so that's not really part of our culture in New York. It was very different to me when I moved there. And I was like, okay, people are more expressive and I can start to understand a little bit more about them by their dress. Same when I went to London, I could look, I did my study abroad in London and that's where my eyes really started opening to see like, oh my gosh, people are not all dressed in Abercrombie and Fitch t-shirts <laughs> and all dressed the same. Like they all have their own identity and they're piecing things together in really interesting ways. And if you went to a, a school where you had uniforms, you never had that chance. So it's understanding as adults, we are confused. It's completely makes sense. Yeah. And I guess you don't really know where to go either to be like, can somebody tell me what to wear? Because now you're in your 20s trying to figure it out because you had nothing but a uniform. And as much as I think sales associates are super helpful, a lot of times they're just based on knowing their product. They this sell, this is a really great piece. It's, sell, it's selling great. This is so hot right now. Yeah. They don't understand. They're not asking yeah. about your lifestyle. And I, yeah, one of the things that you said that I really found interesting is not falling into the trends once you do know what your style is and you don't have to fall into the trend of like, I got to be in this trend of what everybody else is wearing. One thing I've noticed over the years, I'm like, good for that trend, but that trend doesn't look good on me. That trend doesn't make me feel good right? There are certain pieces of clothing in my closet that make me feel good that are my, my go-to power things. There are colors that make me feel good. There's also colors that I love. Like I am a girl. I am a pink girl. I cannot wear pink. Pink is not my color for clothing. And one day I just had to accept it. I'm like, you're just not a pink girl. You're a red girl. You're a purple girl. You're <laughs> not a pink girl. So I'm like, okay, so my environment can be pink, but my clothing cannot be. 100%. And, you know, what you're really hitting on is what I believe in and I'm trying to help people understand is that your clothing is an extension of acceptance of yourself. It, your wardrobe should be, and it's so often used as a marketing tool to make people feel like they need to aspire to be something they aren't instead of just that acceptance of, I want to be inspired to be better and to understand who I am, but I don't need to aspire to be someone else or look like something else or wear a certain trend. So really my goal for anybody is to understand who you are and then the language of how clothing communicates that intent. I love it. I love it. I mean, I love the company I work for, Sales Gravy, orange, not my color, right? Like we're just tough. Orange, color. like from a being on brand perspective. Now my podcast, you can see is red, right? The branding colors of the podcast are red for a reason, right? And I went through a lot of planning on that too, to plan out what would the look be of the company and the look of the podcast and the look of the podcast was based on my personality and matching my personality and my style when I came up with that. That's a whole nother, right? That's a whole nother world. But right, how do we style a business? And that's a that's a huge part of it. What is the business you? Is the business a message? Is it what's the business and one thing I work with and working with a few companies of understanding what their brand is as a business and how to align know the employee messaging or help their employees understand this is what the brand is this is how the style aligns with it but this is how you also interject who you are even if you're not that brand like high end whatever that style yeah. brand is because right now it's a difficult world and nobody knows what the hell to wear post-covid there's no dress codes there no and i'm sure with sales you get this of what am i walking into sometimes am i walking into 
a super casual environment where if I'm too dressed up, I'm, there's going to be a disconnect. Am I walking into a corporate environment? And, and it's not what it used to be. It's not like now and the finance, it's going to be suits because it's not now. Yeah, it's th- that is that it is very different. You don't know what you're walking into on a Zoom call with maybe a new prospect that you don't really know them. You can do some homework and research. And I we can now kind of segue and transition into that and how we show up. Now, we we talk about this at Sales Gravy of uh, mentioned being camera ready. Like we always have to be camera ready, Zoom ready, which means if you're a woman, your hair is done, your makeup is done. I've had people that I work with and train when I've talked to women, especially on this. One woman's like, I just I don't want to wear makeup. I don't like makeup. Are you telling me I have to wear makeup? I'm like, no. I'm not. Um, Just put yourself together. Just at least brush your hair. If makeup is not your thing, I'm not saying you have to wear makeup. Whatever camera ready is for you and how that aligns with your company and with your customers, right? Yeah. Putting your best foot forward, whatever that. Yeah. Whatever that means to you. Now, with that being said, too, during COVID, we spent a lot of time in virtual selling skills, right? And talking about that and how you do show up. And there's something to be said about, and I'm sure you can chime in on this, of our brain knows what we're wearing. Like our brain knows if we're not wearing pants. And so if you're showing up in Lululemon yoga pants, your brain knows. And so your brain is going, how you show up and function is is goes hand in hand with what you're wearing. What are your thoughts on that? A hundred percent. I mean, COVID was the great example of it. Of um, once we got past that curse, not getting flattened in two weeks, it's like I had to set a routine for myself every day. Get up, shower by this time, put on hard pants for me. It was hard, put pants. On hard pants and a real top, even if it's a sweatshirt, but something that I would be okay walking to lunch and it wasn't walking to lunch then but right. putting that idea of if I ran into anybody or someone pops on a zoom call am I going to want to turn my camera off am I going to want to be embarrassed or put on a heavy filter and, and the productivity aligned it was setting those the ritual it's like having the ritual of getting dressed and showing up I'm not saying you have to be in a dress and high heel it's just that respect for the environment that you're walking into or logging into, um, showing up, looking nice. Because we all know, why do you put your sweatpants on? Why do you wear, like, stay in pajamas all day? It's so you can fester and lounge on the couch. Right. (laughs) Right. That's also a ritual. Like, you know what? I'm putting my comfies on because I'm going to sit on the couch and put Netflix on, you know? And that's an opposite ritual of telling your body and signaling it's time to decompress. So the opposite is true. Putting on clothes that you feel good in that are professional, whatever that means. That's a ritual, the signal to your body. Time to work. Time to do this. Yeah. And I think many of us have made that. We've adapted to that. I have the ritual. I get up, I shower, I get ready. I put on hard pants. (laughs) I have have created a little bit of a uniform for myself with that. And and then when I'm done, I mean, if I'm not on the road, I'm in my home studio. So I'm home. But we even picked the house specifically for this. The home studio is on the second floor. I literally have to walk to work and march up the stairs. It's ritual. It's commuting. I'm commuting. I'm going to work. And then I go home for lunch and I go down the stairs to go to lunch. And then I come back up. And at the end of the day, I go back down and I get into the sweats. Right. The ritual is there. I'm no longer in work clothes. Yeah. And I think people take away, there is that resistance sometime of like individuality. I'm going to do what I want. But I think people are also taking away that idea that it is, like it is a ritual and our brain responds to signals. Yeah. It's Pavlovian in that way. (laughs) Yeah. Your body knows like, yeah, you know, all business on top and party on the bottom, really not the best way to go. And maybe it is a modified, like, of course you want to be comfortable. You're not standing up, but You want to feel like you're honoring the day's tasks. Yeah, 100%. So we talked a little bit about the six styles. I want to now kind of go back to, you were talking about building your business, right? You went from one client to two clients to three clients. 
Walk us through some of that experience of how you started to build your business because I'm sure it wasn't easy because you're selling something that people are like, do I really need this? Do I want to spend money on this? I mean, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I mean, I did not have a business background and I I was 26 years old. I was a baby and it was a couple of things that were really hard was pricing. And of course, rookie mistake, completely undercharged because then like getting any money was like the coolest thing ever. So it was hard, number one, to figure out how to structure the services. Number two, how to have retention in clients of what is this soft sell, hard sell? Like I, that didn't come naturally to me at first, understanding that what touch points with people are truly authentic and me having to get out of my own head to say like, no, you really care about these people and you're providing something that's valuable to them instead of feeling like, oh, how are they going to think I'm selling to them? Are they going to think I'm icky? So it, that was a difficult piece. And the educational tool of people just understanding what the hell I was doing to that point. My dad would say, well, you just shop for rich people for a living. I'm like, no, I was hitting a different target yes. market. I wasn't working with socialites. I, it was a completely different demographic. So of course I did invest in getting good SEO so I could pop up top of the search pages and then invested in coaching along the way too of how do I package it? Do I put my prices out there? Do I not? And I ultimately chose transparency and everything. Um, With that, I want any context that I get to truly be interested because I was wasting so much time telling people my prices. And then as interested as they were, if they hadn't budgeted for that, then it was a wasted 30 minutes for me. And now if I have my prices, I have learned that I've become aspirational. I've had people that have followed me for years and said, you know what, I finally got that promotion. And I was like, I'm going to hire BU Style or I'm going to hire Natalie. And so I think it was just really figuring out how to structure how many services were too many services, how to create my book of business and stay in touch with them in a way that felt really authentic to me get my newsletter out. All those processes, I hired a director of operations about three or four years ago. And she was like changing and really templating everything that I did. So I have all those touch points built into my CRM and everything that I do. So it was a lot of misses along the way because I didn't really have people in my industry to look to and say, well, this is how they do it. And eventually found other colleagues and people that I always believe in community. So within my industry of like, how are you doing it? What pain points are you having? How can we tackle this together? And I'm so lucky now I get mostly referrals and I'm at the point where I'm having to turn down one-on-one clients and I'm hiring another style strategist. So just feel really lucky. Yeah, I was just going to ask you. And what? And I worked hard for it. So I guess not lucky. I feel like I, I goddamn earned this. Well, I mean, it can start to feel lucky when you get to that certain point where it starts to hum and it starts to work. And all of a sudden you're attracting abundance and you're like, oh, man, I'm getting lucky. But you actually worked really hard to create the luck. Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm, I just get to reap a lot of that goodwill and the connections that I've built. And I feel grateful when you, of course, when you get referrals, it's usually from your favorite clients. So they're an extension of them. So then I I feel like I get a lot of really, I just, I love my clients and the people I work with. So it, it sounds like a lot of what you do from a sales perspective, a lot of it comes to you based on word of mouth. You might not have to outbound prospect as much because people are referring you. You mentioned SEO. Are you still doing things like marketing related, SEO related things to still keep yourself out there? What does that look like? I'm doing a little less SEO in that way for one-on-one clients. Now we're shifting toward, I'm working with a lot of business clients and speaking engagements. And so it's a shift there. So SEO guy has got to come in soon and change my keywords. And, but of course I continue to update content on my website that's relevant, produce meaningful articles and insights. So that's a valuable tool for me. Starting the podcast has been a very valuable tool, maybe not straight generating revenue, but people listen, they connect. And so I'm getting the right kind of clients that come in now. And I have noticed that it's less about 
just popping to the top of the search page now. It's for those that are clicking here, clicking there and connecting with yeah. the way that I'm working because now I don't need volume. There was a time when I just needed volume to pay that New York rent and put food on the table. And now I'm in a privileged position to be able to work on creating funnels that will connect with the right types of clients and the right different revenue streams that I'm working on building. Well, let's talk a little bit about revenue streams as far as, especially when you're doing any kind of coaching, any kind of one-on-one work. We often talk about hours for dollars and how do we scale that to the point where we're not working ourselves to death? Your What do your revenue streams look like? What do your offerings look like? How have you structured that to grow your business so that you're not working as hard? Yeah, that's a great question that I still haven't fully solved, but we're working on that. So building a team is one in which stylists get to come under me. They get trained by me. They get the benefit of a a established business, which is hard to come by in this industry. So we'll do a split there. So when they're working and I'm on vacation, I'm still getting a revenue from my team. The assessment is one key piece of that's a scalable service for me and leads to more virtual offerings. I did and there's books coming, hopefully working on that next. And it's really it. And for me, I don't charge hourly. I charge by a service. So we're charging based on results. So I've been able to understand which clients probably aren't going to take as long. And so that's the day I can pack more clients in. And then there's other like we play with different monthly memberships or different subscription type. subscription type things. For me, it's hard to do a lot of digital coaching and courses right now that just hasn't aligned with my methodology. Yeah. But I also do business consulting. And of course, that's where a lot of once you get into that world of business consulting and then I can create more funnels for a team of stylists under me. So it's more, yeah. I start becoming the mouthpiece of the business and become a trusted brand. So that way I am very fortunately, when I first started bringing stylists under me, I was very concerned about people only wanting me. So I had to get that away and just make sure I brought in people that understood the ethos of the business, how we want to work. I have touch points with people coming in through my automation, but now I have clients saying, Matt, if you can't do it, could one of your team members work with me? And that's been the ultimate like, yes, okay, I'm now creating a trusted brand that people understand that whatever I build, it's still an extension of what they equate with with me. So I think that was probably the biggest eye-opening piece and get rid of my own ego and my own like fear of finding the right people, training them well, having good processes. So you know, that ex- part of the business, which is really where I've built all my goodwill as other parts grow, can can continue to funnel into our revenue. Yeah, that makes sense. When I owned an improv comedy theater and school and corporate entity to that for bringing improv into businesses in the very beginning when I was everything, and then I had to bring people in under me, otherwise I was going to die there was the initial struggle from customers, right? There was the initial struggle, like you talk about the aspirational, right? All of a sudden, someone would be like, I'm ready to sign up and now you're not teaching. I'm like, no, but Jeffrey is amazing. He's going to teach in the style of our culture, but he's got his own unique way and you're still going to get the experience of the brand, right? And so it took a while to get comfortable Because you feel like you're disappointing people, but really you're just, you're growing. And I think the coolest part, and I'm I'm sure you've experienced this, is when people, when customers come around to liking your people more than they like you, right? You're like, yay. It's amazing. It's amazing (laughs) because I'm like, every pot has a lid and I, there's certain of my team members and I'm like, you know what? You work with that client better than I could because it's a human relationship. Yeah. And so there are certain people that I'm like, you know what, I think you're better for them. And so it got, it has gotten to the point where certain prospective clients come in and it's like, you know what, you're better working with. Exactly. Them, exactly. And that's so you, a good place to be. 
it's a great place and, and it teaches you how to let go of ego a little bit and not like in the very beginning, I'm like, oh, they like him better than me. And then it's like, right. no, that's good. That's good. You want them to like the, you want them to like, like the rest of your team so that you can then, right. Cause then the, your value just goes up higher. Right. Cause. And that's the other piece is of course, as principal, I should be charging more. You should be at the um, higher rate. The experience, I should be at the higher rate and I should be able to really focus on those clients that I can make meaningful impact with because well, let's face it, when you do, when I'm doing what I did with the clients I did 13 years ago, it's also not as inspiring to me as much as I, I love them. But the thrill of that is when you're an entrepreneur, you always want that, you want to be pushed. Yeah. And so I like challenging myself because that will ultimately funnel down into the business and taking those clients that are that really like getting into it and we continue to dive in and just really like, yeah well it's juicy love it when you work um when you work with your businesses tell me a little bit more about that what does it look like as far as like the services that you do offer what are are you working one-on-one addressing people like how does that work so businesses work in multiple ways. And so it is sometimes helping with this dress code in this new world of defining their wardrobe guidelines and what that looks like in a place of inclusivity and and empowerment with their employees. So we'll work together. That's one way. Another is just speaking engagements of they're having offsites or they're a lot of women's networks within a company will bring me in to do speaking engagements. Sometimes we'll do small workshops within different teams of an organization, like I'm working with an events company and they have different segments that are some are client facing, some aren't, they all have different roles and responsibilities. So it's kind of workshopping what dress codes would look like, what their style brand would look like, how they can represent the company, how can they represent the event well. And so that's another realm. And then some, I will work one-on-one with a certain executive that are, on tracks that the company's investing in and like we're in this track. And there's a couple, actually a couple of people are interested for their sales teams to talk about how to use dress codes for influencing and aligning. Yeah. And that was going to be my next, yeah, that was going to be my next question. And I'm assuming men and women. And so for salespeople, let's just talk about that for a second. For salespeople, I'm big into, I have a performance background. How do you show up on stage? We are on stage as salespeople. Uh, maybe some of these salespeople were like me and came out of Catholic school wearing uniforms. I don't think we have to talk so much about the value of your style when you're showing up in front of people, but what is some advice that you would give on, maybe there are people out there that are just not comfortable having this conversation because they don't know what to talk about with how to dress. What would your suggestion be to inspire them, especially since you're an enthusiastic inspirer? Inspirer. So I always say, so the question is people who have no clue even where to start. Yeah, I mean, maybe no clue where to start or maybe they just haven't been thinking about what, what is my style? How should I have a style? Do I need a style? We know that it's important on how you show up. And maybe you talk a little bit about that, like, What is the perception of how people receive you and how would that affect sales? I mean, it it always, the minute you walk into the room, the first filter before you open your mouth is a filter for judgment is what you're wearing. So whether you like it or not, there is going to be a judgment. That is the number one thing we have to understand, whether it's a cognitive judgment on somebody and first impressions matter a lot. So there's that. I think when you're talking about your own style, there's a lot of things you can do is actually start looking at the world around you and seeing what do I like? What do I not like? Because I think sometimes we just don't even look at it and critically think about it. What in my, why do I keep going to the same three outfits over and over in my own closet? What about those pieces do I like? Is it the reaction of others? Is it how it feels on my skin? Is it how I look in it? Like, what do I like about how I look in it? So those are a few places to start. And then when it comes to walking into an environment, I think you always should think about the environment you're walking into, especially when you are trying to influence that environment, which is what sales it, right? You're performing in order for people to receive your, what you're giving them. So 
always look at the space you're walking into and what the dress codes are there, what the general dress environment is. And I always think you should align to that in some sort of way. It's like that, think about it like a job interview on how if you're now going into super creative advertising, you're still wearing your suit and tie to an interview. Like that right there is an immediate disconnect in a wall. So it is, if people feel like they could, the presidents, which ones did they sit, think they could sit and have a beer with? Those are probably the ones they're going to like open up to and trust and be receptive. So it's for me aligning to that space and understanding what you're walking into. If you know you're in a super corporate place, even if it's on Zoom, somehow align. Or if you know they have a certain color to that point of branding, is there, we're in this renegade thing and they wear the red. You already have that, but it's like, you know what? If you want to have an instant camaraderie, you wear the red to be like, yeah, I got my red on today. Got my red on. Uh, So you can also make conversations through your wardrobe choices or create connection. Oh yeah. That reminds me. I can't can't believe I haven't told you this. I've got, I've got a pair of cowboy boots that are my, like my other signature and Mm -hmm. they are sparkly. And I bought them. I've got two pairs of boots that I bought in Texas and they're both blingy, but one is blingier than the other, like Savorsky crystal blingy, right? With jeans. And I get stopped every time I wear them multiple times a day. If I'm out like traveling and I'm at the airport, I've had men stop me and like, where'd you get those boots? I want to buy them for my wife. Like, my those boots are made for talking, not walking, talking. They are such a signature item that if I want to get attention and get conversations going, I just wear those boots. Well, and I mean, and is- clothes and clothes, boots and clothes. Oh, okay, fine. You're not like a <laughs> Nike cowboy. Be like, so you might see me in Times Square. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm the cowgirl, naked cowgirl. You know what? Their wardrobe is talking pieces. Like I wear a hummingbird necklace and people ask me about it. My mother loved hummingbirds and passed away. And that creates a conversation and that can spiral into, well, my mother passed away. I'm so sorry. She loved hummingbirds. What significance? I mean, there are so many conversations. So that's another piece. If you have something that I want to have a talking piece on me, wear a talking piece. If you know that's what you're walking into, or maybe use that as a way, like I, I'm nervous starting conversations. Well, if you know someone's alma mater was something, then like wear the color of their alma mater. Like I'm wearing my whatever. Exactly. Exactly. Sometimes I put things in the background just in in my studio of like a geography that I know is going to connect to people. And that's helped me, right? Like different baseball yeah. caps from different sports teams. I mean, I love Broadway. And so I purposely, and whenever I love a show, I buy a Broadway t-shirt and one of my signatures is a blazer and a Broadway t-shirt. So I know immediately if somebody connects with that, we are going to have an amazing conversation. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I forgot all about the fact that I've got those, those signature boots that get people talking to me every single time. And then you also know if you want to blend in and you want to be more soft, you probably shouldn't wear the cowboy boots because you're going to get stopped. If you need to get somewhere quickly, don't wear them. Exactly. Exactly. So there are days where I'm like, I'm not going to wear these because someone's going to stop me and I don't feel like talking today. So I'm not wearing them. So dialing back to as we get ready to wrap up this show for for the listeners, for anybody in sales, Right. What we're talking about dress, dressing for yourself and your style and your personality, but also dressing for your audience. I've often heard this where, well, the people I sell to, they're in hoodies all day. And right. So that's fine. Have a modified version that is still says I'm business. Right. They can be in their hoodies and their Lululemons. But you still have to be the trusted advisor. And I think that's going to speak through how you're styled. And Natalie's shaking her head. Yes, with this. And then the question some of you might have is, well, how do I know? How do I know what I'm walking into? Okay, sales folks, that is our job is to find that out some way, somehow ahead of time. Do your homework, do your research, talk to other stakeholders in the organization and find out what you're walking into. I work with the military a lot. I dress completely differently when I'm training military recruiters than I would if I'm working 
in a SaaS space or in any kind of a conservative accounting type of space, I have a little bit of a different style. Probably not showing my cleavage. Not that I'm showing my cleavage on a regular basis, but you know what I'm saying. I have a different style for different audiences, but it's still a style that fits me, that makes me feel good. So there's that. If people want to work with you, Natalie, what are the best ways to connect with you and reach out to you? Yeah, people can check out my website, which is www.bu, that's the letters B-U dot style, no dot com. So just www.bu.style or they can follow my personal Instagram account, which is at Natalie underscore Tincher, that's T-I-N-C-H-E-R, or my business account at B-U style. Those are probably the best ways and you can follow every other channel from there and connect, sign up for the newsletter and all that good stuff. And the assessment, is that a paid assessment, free assessment? It's a paid assessment online under the website. You'll see it under personal services. Okay, great. So so people can go at least take that assessment and get to know their style, right? A hundred percent. And then from there, there are resources, a guide for them where they can then connect with me or one of my team members virtually to start the exploration. Fantastic. It has been so awesome having you on the show talking about this. Truly a pleasure. I could nerd out all day and I love the alignment and what you're doing and letting me be a woman that mothers did warn people (laughs) about me. (laughs) I used to ask that question all the time and I've gotten away from asking like, are you a woman your mother warns you about? Yeah, not at first. And then I slowly, my therapist, we call me a sweet rebel. So a sweet rebel. Still a rebel though. I love it. You're a sweet rebel. I think I'm a sassy rebel and we are renegades. Thank you so much, Natalie, for being on the show today. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks. Hey, listeners, thanks for listening to this episode of The Women Your Mother Warned You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy. And You don't just want to upgrade your style, but you want to upgrade your skills. So go to salesgravy.university and check out over 200 courses, both live and on demand there, including some courses that I have created. So go check that out and we'll see you on the next show because you can see us on YouTube as well as listen to us wherever you hear your podcast. See you next time.